Is that working? Yeah. Should we start? Okay. Um, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, since you've kindly left coffee on time to come and join us, I think we should start. I think more people will trickle in over the next few minutes. We have 40 people online as well, so I think to, to do them credit, we should get going. Uh, I've been asked to read out a few housekeeping points first before we get into the panel. Uh, for those of you online, if you wish to listen to this in a different language, you can use the worldly translation uh, on the Cvent app. If those of you online want to ask a question, and I hope you will after what's going to be a very interesting panel, you can use the chat function. For those of you in the room, our friend Kola, Monsieur Bokum, will be speaking in French. So if you don't understand French, please grab some headphones uh, at, the, at the entrance and you can listen to his intervention on Channel One, which is the English channel. And for this intimate group we have here, we'll have, a, I think, a short panel, and then let's try and get a discussion going. So just put your hand up if you would like to ask any questions, and I'll make sure that you get a chance. And the final thing on housekeeping, which is not for me because I'm far too old for this, but if those of you who are interested in social media wish to share anything, please use the hashtags, hashtag Fragility Forum and hashtag FF2024 for the youngsters in the room uh, and online. My name's Khalid Kosser. I'm the Executive Director of the Global Community Engagement and Resilience Fund, GSURF for short. Uh, GSURF is the Global Fund for Preventing Violent Extremism. We're a grant-making organization. We provide, we provide grants to local civil society-based organizations, and you're going to hear from two of them uh, on this panel, and we have a very specific focus on preventing violent extremism. And I think what that means when you put it together is we identify people at risk of radicalization, at risk of recruitment, and we try to provide better alternatives. And you're going to hear from our colleagues about how we do that and whether or not we're successful uh, in, in doing that. This session specifically is on re rehabilitation and reintegration, a theme that I, I, I started discussing yesterday for those of you who had a chance to attend uh, in, in my lightning talk uh, in the big auditorium. Let me set the scene then with a couple of comments and then invite our panelists to, to, to intervene and I'll, I'll interrogate them a little bit to try to make it a provocative and interesting session. Firstly, I'm pleased that the World Bank has allowed us to put violent extremism, depressingly but importantly, on this FCV, Fragility Conflict Violence Agenda. Uh, I believe and our analysis demonstrates that the global environment is more conducive to violent extremism today than at any point since the Arab Spring. Violent extremism is sadly a rising challenge for all of us, and I think we have to be aware of that. Secondly, I'm very pleased that within this context of violent extremism, we're focusing on rehabilitation and reintegration. Almost a contradictory trend. We have rising risks of radicalization around the world, but also rising numbers of people who are defecting and leaving terrorist groups and going home. 
And I think an important challenge is to make sure that we can reintegrate, rehabilitate, make sure that these people don't become recidivists. It's an important point of work with historic highs of people disengaging from terrorist groups. The third point, and it's something I, a point I made in the lecture the other day, that the lightning talk, I don't think these agendas are necessarily independent. We are finding in GSERF, and again, I think we'll hear some examples from our panelists, that if you can work on rehabilitating and reintegrating former violent extremists, they can also be powerful agents to stop other people becoming terrorists in the first place. So working on return is a way to stop the cycle of terrorism, perhaps starting uh, for other people. Much of the attention when we speak about rehabilitation and reintegration of violent extremism is on the camps, of course, in northeast Syria. And this is an important location. There are still 45,000 people or so who are waiting to return to Iraq, the Western Balkans, Central Asia, uh, and elsewhere. And we'll be hearing from Albania, a country that's been really in the forefront of returning its nationals from those camps, and also Iraq, uh, where there are huge numbers of people both returning and pending return. I think it's important that we don't over-focus on the camps in northeast Syria. Rehabilitation and reintegration is a global challenge and I think a global opportunity as well. And in that context, we're going to hear from the Philippines and Mali about their work rehabilitating and reintegrating people from local uh, terrorist organisations. And my final introductory point is that I'm pleased in this technical uh, building of, of the World Bank that we are going to hear from people who are making policy people who are working on the ground with returnees. We've got civil society representatives, we've got government representatives, and I think it's good that we've got a mix of people who can really speak from the ground up uh, about their experiences, the challenges and opportunities in rehabilitation and reintegration. So the, the running order, I think very quickly, I'll invite each of our panelists to give a couple of minutes introduction to the context for rehabilitation and reintegration in their particular settings. We'll then get into a, a bit of a Q&A that I will lead, and then over to you, colleagues, both online and in the room, to ask your questions or share your uh, experiences. So I think without further ado, let's begin, and if we could, uh, Romina, let's begin with you. Delighted uh, that Romina Kuko, who is the Deputy Interior Minister of the Government of Albania, has managed to join us for a couple of days from a very busy country with a lot of very important things taking place. Romina, it's a pleasure to see you again. Uh, you're an expert in security sector reform, uh, community policing, domestic violence, and of course, preventing and combating violent extremism. Tell us, if you would, a little bit about the context in Albania for, for our law. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, first of all, I want to, to thank GSERF, and of course, I want to thank the World Bank for hosting this event. and. I just want to repeat your words, uh, Dr. Kosser, that it's really important that um, violent extremism is on the agenda of the, of the World Bank and RNR is also on the agenda. So um, regarding Albania, Albania is a very curious case because uh, we did have the uh, traveling of Albanian citizens in the conflict zone in 2013, 2014, in which we had foreign terrorist fighters and their families traveling to the conflict zone. So this made it a very, very complicated operation for the Albanian government to, to tackle that, uh, that element. Very shortly, first, we changed the criminal code right uh, after we had the first travelings of the FTFs in the conflict zone. So we criminalized the um, uh, intentions to go and fight in another country, which drastically dropped the amount of people to zero. But we know that CV is a moving, moving target, and uh, if a, in a certain moment there is an, a rise of radicalization, there will come a certain moment in which we will have to deal with the rehabilitation and the reintegration of, of people. So uh, we, uh, as a country, I think that are pioneers of reintegration because right in the moment where many countries had the dilemma of having people back in the countries or not, we took a very determinant, uh, let's say, move into repatriating women and children in, uh, in the country. And this was a very, let's say, uh, something that we were determined to do, but without the help and support of our partners, without the help and support of GSERF, 
that would be impossible. So we employed a very multi-agency, multi-layered, multi-actor um, approach by having all the government being involved in the in this operation, by having the civil society being involved, by having the armed forces support us with the facilities in which uh, first hand we are, we're about to um, uh, to have these people, let's say, for the very first moments of, of their treatments. And then we employ the local government into giving them all the services, the housing, the social servicing, the schools for the kids in order for them to, to be reintegrated. And now, of course, we have a very successful um, project. We have a center for countering violent extremism, which is under the Ministry of Interior. I want to thank all the staff of the center for doing a great job. But I also want to reiterate that without the support of GSERF and the programs that you are doing in, in uh, all the rehabilitation work, that would be impossible. So this was, in a nutshell, the very first reaction. Thank you. Thanks very much. And you can put this on. I can hear a theme emerging already about a whole of a society approach involving local governments. We'll come back and interrogate that a little further. But just in this lightning round, getting some context, I mean, Albania, you know, relatively small numbers of people, a, a relatively wealthy country that can really focus on intensive support for people returning and rehabilitating. In contrast, Iraq very large numbers of people returning and pending return, clearly a poorer country with, with much larger challenges to confront, including internal displacement and others. Delighted that from Baghdad, Omar al-Dalimi has joined us. He has many years' experience working with the Iraqi government, supporting the Iraqi government in its strategy on preventing violent extremism. He's also, I'm very proud to say, recently joined GSERF as our national advisor based in Baghdad to take forward our work, not just on rehabilitation and reintegration, but also some wider challenges, for example, climate change, which we might come to as well, Omar. So, Omar, a few words about the setting and the challenges that you confront in Iraq, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Khalid. So, just kind of the overall uh, overview of what's going on in Iraq. Um, the, uh, what the Iraqi government has decided, there are um, about 27,000 Iraqi citizens um, in al Hol, northeast Syria that the Iraqi government has decided to repatriate back to Iraq. And this is a decision that was made about two years ago. And now uh, we're trying to uh, accomplish this process over the next three years. There is 27,000 people. Uh, most of them are women and kids. But over there are also a couple of thousand uh, male, uh, adult male prisoners are also being held by Kurdish authorities in northeast Syria. Now, there is a, a lot of challenges associated with, with this process. First. Um, this population, 27,000, have been uh, living in the most harsh conditions for the past seven years in El Hod. Um, not even that, they have been exposed to a very high level of violent extremism in, the, in those camps. And there's also, there's a very notable violent extremism uh, sentiment held by, these, uh, by this population because these, these are groups that have, many of them have decided to, you know, to stay with ISIS uh, as the liberation battles were happening. So there is a notable senti um, n n violent extremism sentiment uh, being held uh, by them. And they have a high distrust of local authorities or governments uh, in, the, in that area. Now, the challenges are not just on that side, but there's also many challenges on the Iraqi side. The communities that these families are from have high um, um, distrust level of these uh, of these families that they were trying to do, and not even that. But in, in addition, they, these communities are largely from rural areas, and rural areas tend to be less uh, have less access to resources, um, and they are not kind of benefiting from the boom or the kind of the recent developments that are happening in Iraq in terms of economy, in terms of the improved security. So you know, this is the kind of just a, a general overview of the challenges kind of from uh, on in Hod and in, in, in Iraq as well. Thanks, Omar. And already the contrast, I think, emerging. And again, we'll interrogate those, those differences as we go through the panel and the discussion. We have a deputy minister. We also have a princess with us as well. I'm delighted to reintroduce to, 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 to myself and to all of you Rohanisa Sumdad Usman from uh, the Philippines. Very kindly hosted me a few months ago in the Philippines. We had a wonderful time uh, together. Rohanisa, you're the founder and chief peace mission keeper of Teach Peace, Build Peace movement, a non-profit organization, and this is important, that aims to make every Filipino child and youth a peace hero. And I've seen your work on the ground and it's truly impressive. So a different context, not Northeast Syria, local terrorist groups, but the same challenges of reintegration and, and rehabilitation. Perhaps share a few words about the context. Thank you. 
Um, a peaceful day, everyone. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, let me give uh, a perspective um, with regard to the situation of children and youth in the Philippines. In my almost 20 years of uh, doing peace missions, looking at the psychological lens of PVE, specifically on addressing the struggles of uh, children and youth, is very significant. In our experience in the Philippines, the most common denominator of children and youth joining violent groups are, first, most of them are uh, looking into their sense of um, purpose, sense of love, and sense of belongingness. Second, what's common about their situation is that uh, most of them were bullied, were discriminated against, they uh, experience trauma in, in their lives. And at the same time, um, they, they actually had a lot of personal struggles before they became part of uh, a particular violent extremist group. And um, most of Teach Peace, Build Peace movement's mission for the past 10 years uh, has been on the protection and prevention side of children and youth, we really wanted. We really want to um, protect and prevent children and youth from joining violent groups. We want to develop them to be peace heroes. Thus, we conduct peace education formation sessions where they learn and practice peace and nonviolence as a way of life while engaging their children, uh, w while engaging their teachers and parents who have such great influence on their behavior and development. And um, in the 2017 Marawi siege, we saw numerous children who were part of the violent extremist group, a lot of them very young, youngest was five, six years old, were already trained to fight, to hold guns, to make bombs. And um, this sad reality prompted us to expand our scope of peace education programs for, to children uh, and youth returnees. Uh, returnees in our terminology means uh, an individuals who used to be part of a violent extremist group. And we were able to expand uh, to, to what we call aftercare peace track. Uh, this was made possible, of course, by, um, by G-Surf, through our partnership with G-Surf. And in our experience, um, we really felt the need to develop uh, more interventions for children and youth returnees. Uh, we developed uh, the aftercare peace track program, which was an integration of caring for their psychosocial health and educating them about how to have peace within themselves and how to have peace with others. And we, we use the term care to give much emphasis on its great value uh, to a returnee's appreciation for peaceful coexistence and strengthening of resilience. So that's how, that's the story of how we started our reintegration and rehabilitation program. Great, thanks very much. And of course, an important theme there is, is working with the community in addition to the returnees, making sure that that programming is part of the wider community spirit. And we'll come back and perhaps discuss that. Our final panelist, just to introduce himself and his work in his region, is our friend Abdou Kola Bokoum, who will be speaking in French. So please do grab a headphone if you wish to, to follow what he's saying and you don't speak uh, French. Uh, Kola is the national coordinator of the NGO Think Peace Sahel, which works on security, conflict management, and of course, the prevention of violent extremism in Mali, Burkina Faso, and Niger, note those three countries. The challenge, not just of climate change, but also of political changes in his countries as well. Kola, welcome, please. Merci beaucoup. Thank you so much, and hello, everyone. First, I'd like to recognize the uh, opportunity here, not only to explain our strategy as an NGO, but also to explain how uh, those who are working on the ground in Mali are working to prevent violent extremism. Mali is uh, 
over one million uh, square kilometers in surface area. And it is there are also uh, many extremist groups who have been able to uh, set themselves up in different regions, and they have uh, carried out very harmful activities against different communities. For a bit of time, I would say since 2012, we have noticed a certain number of uh, people that we believe are terrorists who have been put into prison in Bamako. And we noticed that this was a an interesting moment uh, uh, that we could use to expand our work in the prison system. So we were able to work on prevention of radicalization. And so with GSERF, we were lucky enough to be uh, to receive their support uh, starting in 2020. And we were able to put together an approach that uh, led to positive results on the ground. We were able to implement several programs, in particular, a uh, program that is uh, for um, returnees who want to create positive change. It is for those who are have left extremist groups. And our approach consists of uh, working with the community in order to adopt a solution that is going to work at several different levels. We have also worked with the government, and I know that little by little, um, when I continue my presentation later on, I can talk to you more about the details of our work, but we have worked with the Ministry of Justice, and we have worked on the rehabilitation and reintegration of the prison population once they are out of prison. We are the only group in Niger and in Mali that works in the prison systems, that works to de-radicalize uh, people who are currently in prison. Unfortunately, as I said earlier, we are fighting or we are working against several different terrorist and violent organizations. And so we need to make sure that we are using a multifaceted approach to work with the community. And we have benefited from the support of GSERF from 2020, and we hope that with their support, we can have better results and we can get some uh, results with uh, integration of the community. We are also working with community organizations for host communities. These are the communities that will be accepting returnees into their community. So I would like to say that, um, but I hope that you will have some questions so that we can talk more about the details of this. Very much indeed. Uh, w one of the challenges of, of working on preventing violent extremism is the context is so important. It's so different in different parts of the world. GSERF works across 23 countries, and even within those countries, the differences between regions and cities and rural areas is really very striking. I just scribbled down already from those four very introductory comments a couple of contrasts that, that, to note. Uh, I think we contrast, I would say, in Albania, a, a very individual, family-focused work on case management, linking people with services, support, contrasting with perhaps the Philippines where this is much more about community-based integration, letting communities lead, uh, making sure that programming benefits the wider community and doesn't just focus on the individuals. I think I also noted a contrast between really working on individuals and with individuals and the wider community. I think that's an interesting contrast that's emerging. Trust is interesting. I think I heard from you in Albania, that there is trust within local communities for people returning. I think I heard pretty clearly from Omar that there isn't trust at the moment within local communities, uh, and that trust deficit, I think, is a real challenge in particular uh, in Iraq. And I think also thinking about Iraq and Mali in particular, you know, in some countries, maybe the Philippines, certainly Albania, the main violent extremist challenge at the moment is this question of return. In others, you have far, a far wider context, whether it's climate change, government uh, changes, political changes as well. So embedding return and reintegration into the wider violent extremist challenge, I think, is, is equally important. Let me just probe a little bit further our panelists, and then I hope you'll prepare colleagues online and in the room questions and thoughts from, from your side. Uh, Roman, if I can come back to you in Albania, you will know 
that many countries in the world, including mine, the UK, by the way, are very reluctant to return their nationals, their citizens uh, from northeast Syria. Can you tell us a bit about the thought process that made Albania do this? And tell us about the arguments against it. What arguments did you have to make to convince the government that this was the right thing to do? Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, actually, uh, deciding for um, uh, having an operation on the returnees was not a matter of pros and cons. It was a matter of how. And Albania is noted very much in its history for this very leave no one behind approach. It's in our DNA. Probably uh, not very m uh, many of you know that uh, during the Second World War, Albania was the only country in which uh, the Jewish population was more in numbers after the war uh, than before the war. Well, we sheltered uh, the Jewish population. There is a fantastic history about the Afghan refugees. We hosted uh, two years ago almost 3,000 Afghans in the country prior to them then going, uh, coming to, to the US or Canada or in other countries. And we didn't think it twice because it's exactly in our DNA not to leave anyone behind. So when we talk about communities and when it, we talk about saving people's lives, there is no discussion about it. It was just a matter of how rather than, than uh, pros and cons. So um, it was, you know that in many countries there is a uh, issue because it's very difficult to prove whether some of the people who travel to the conflict zone were engaged. I'm, I'm here talking about also women and this is a very delicate matter and I don't want to, you know, I want to be very um, uh, careful and elegant when I, I talk about women, but it's very difficult to find the evidence and one of the debates that have been, uh, let's say, um, uh, dominating now the agenda of return, uh, returnees has been how do we prove that some people actually had this kind of activity in the conflict zone and it's still a matter of proof and is still a matter of, um, of finding the evidence taking into consideration that in our countries there is a criminal code which will need solid proof for it to be uh, used in the court but as I said, when it comes to uh, saving the lives of children and saving the lives of women, it was no second thought for, for us. Of course, it was very complicated because the operation uh, required a lot of support from our international partners, especially from the US. This is something that helped us a lot into uh, taking these uh, people back in the country. Uh, of course, there are too many challenges in the country because some of the kids were born in the conflict zone. So there was a lot of uh, operations uh, being uh, engaged into proving that they are the kids of the women who are repatriated. How do we give statementship to those kids? How do we make sure that they are registered, they are integrated into the very administrative system of the country? And then we move to the individual, um, uh, let's say, uh, treatment of these, uh, of these people. How do we make sure that they are not bullied in schools? And how do we make sure that the communities are not excluding them? And how do we make sure that the, the, the groups that once used to radicalize those people do not have any effects uh, on them? So it's, um, it's, uh, all of it, it sounds like a, like a beautiful story. And uh, the motivation behind it, it is a beautiful story because here we're talking about saving the lives of people. And for those who are very solid practitioners know very well the hell of Al Hol and the hell of Raj uh, camps uh, in the conflict zone and the conditions in which those people live. And I'm giving you just a very small example before I, I end my, my intervention that we had some kids that were repatriated uh, in Albania and because they have lived in very dire conditions, they didn't recognize a building with two stores. So if you put them in the second store, they couldn't orient themselves because throughout their lives they were just used to living in, to living in dust. So it's, it's, you know, it's a humanitarian matter and for us, it's a, a long-term commitment to have the rehabilitation and the reintegration of these people. It's not a matter of government. It's a matter of a nation who supports its people uh, and its nationals in difficulties and in, the, in these, you know, uh, unfortunate uh, events. Thanks, uh, Romina, and thanks for being honest. I mean, it, it's an opportunity 
it's something that's within the Albanian DNA, as you said, but also clearly represents a huge challenge for, for Albania returning people. All sorts of challenges you've spoken about, from, from legal issues to, to trauma uh, and so on. Omar, we heard from Romina, I mean, she didn't use the, the term, but she kind of alluded to it, the importance of a whole of society approach. In Albania, you know, central government, local authorities, communities, religious leaders, all involved in trying to make this work. Your initial intervention suggested that's not yet the case in Iraq. And it does seem to, to, to me, from my experience of this work, that this really can't be done unless you get a whole of society approach going, unless local communities and local authorities and local teachers and sports coaches are all on the same page in terms of this work. I mean, I guess one of the challenges in Iraq is just the sheer scale and the, and the speed at which this is, we are trying to make this happen. But perhaps say a little bit about how we can hopefully move towards a more whole of society approach in Iraq in, in achieving the goals. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, yeah, as, as you said, the scale of the problem is huge and it requires a lot of uh, entities to come together and work on this. So in Iraq, um, there are dozens of uh, ministries, uh, government entities. Um, we also have security services, multiple security services also involved in, in this process. S local civil society organizations, um, as well as major uh, tribal figures, uh, political representatives, um, and also community leaders. So to get all of these people to come together, you need really strong coordination mechanisms uh, and, and on the ground. And just before, like the whole kind of talking about the whole society approach, I think here we really need a whole whole of government approach to R and R. You know. A lot of these families, they have to be cleared. There, there has to be a lot of security clearances that have to be conducted and, and screenings be, had to be conducted before these families are, are, are returned to Iraq. So, and that involves a lot of government efforts to ensure that these uh, families or these individuals were not involved in any crimes that were committed in Iraq. Um, so that will take a lot of coordination. And what's, uh, what's good to see in Iraq now that f with the UN and the Iraqi government, they have uh, a technical worker group and they have coordination mechanisms in place to, to, to work on, on, on these efforts. Uh, now, um, so now that you have brought these families back and you, uh, you know, so in the case of Iraq, these families are in hold, they come back to a, 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 a Jada camp, it's a rehabilitation center and they, they're provided with the necessary services by government and uh, the international uh, organizations. Once they leave, uh, then kind of becomes the responsibility of the society and also kind of uh, the, the local communities that they could do uh, are responsible with them. And this is where you really need to have a whole of society approach to this, uh, to this issue. Uh, you know, the general feeling is a lot of times like you need to really focus on the returnees themselves and make sure that they are w uh, you know, establish in their communities, but I think a lot of effort needs to be used, directed to the communities themselves that are accepting them. Uh, as I said in my previous comments, these communities are not necessarily all have the resources to accept these uh, uh, returnees back. They have a lot of grievances, they have a lot of uh, stigma got, uh, directed at them. So to ensure a proper and successful reintegration process, um, you need to accommodate for these community, local communities' needs, uh, uh, demands, and even grievances. Um, and uh, you know what's good about what we're working on with GISA for our project uh, in Iraq is that we're directing. You know, a lot of our work is also directed to the returnees themselves. You know, providing MHPSS services, psychosocial, uh, um, legal support, making sure that they return, they have their documents uh, ready, that, so they can their kids can go back to school. Um, but uh, at the same time, we're also directing a significant amount of resources to the com communities themselves, um, trying to uh, make sure that these communities have access to financial aid from the government, um, you know, like make sure that we have proper social cohesion initiatives in place uh, when these families do return. And also kind of working on the soft skills. Uh, sometimes we kind of maybe we'll focus on the high level things like legal matters, psychosocial efforts, but then when the communities do come together, um, there is uh, efforts that you can kind of uh, implement to m make them reconnect. Uh, this is an example of making sure their returnees attend the funerals, attend the weddings, attend the kind of the, these kind of soft events that, uh, that do occur that, uh, that means uh, a lot for their integration uh, efforts. Um, and just kind of to go back on the coordination and mechanisms that are in place to kind of address the needs of the returnees and the needs of the communities. This are, will be really critical because um, these communities are going to kind of will will require a lot of supports 
in the coming years because of the climate-induced dynamics that are happening in, in Iraq. These are rural areas, and the rural areas are suffering at a great, much greater uh, place than in the, in the city centers. And Iraq now is projected to be the you know, seven top uh, countries to be most hit by climate change. Um, water levels are decreasing, farmland is uh, being, uh, desertification is being, uh, occurring to these farmlands. Um, and so you get a lot of these communities trying to leave and go to city centers um, to search for livelihoods. Um, so these coordination mechanisms are going to be very critical to address these uh, needs and ma make sure that these uh, populations have what they need to kind of accommodate the, the changes that are occurring when with that will occur from climate uh, kind of induced issues. Um, yeah, so that's... Thanks very much indeed. I mean, really a complex setting in Iraq and looking forward to working with you and hearing more about it. Roni, so I, when I did my lightning talk yesterday and in the introduction here, I, I drew inspiration from what I'd learned from you when we were together in the Philippines, suggesting that perhaps working on the rehabilitation and reintegration of individuals can also inspire other people not to enter the cycle of terrorism. Can we mobilize the experiences, the insights, the expertise, the commitment of returnees to try to make sure that other people don't turn to extremism. Do you have an experience of that within the, the Philippine setting? Please. Yeah, definitely. Um, I would like to begin by saying that when it comes to reintegration, rehabilitation, and rebuilding trust, uh, I would like to give much emphasis on these points. Definitely, it must be holistic, context-driven, context-sensitive. It must be long-term, and most of all, we must not only put our hard work into it or into the process, but our heart work. And let me further explain what these points mean. Um, at the start of our aftercare peace track, we conducted listening sessions with our children and youth returnees and their families because we wanted to understand deeply what they had gone through in their lives. So their narratives, their, uh, their stories, these all became our baseline when we created the Aftercare Peace Track Implementation Toolkit. So yes, definitely. Um, we, we, our program even became more effective when, there's, when there was a participation where there were inputs coming from returnees themselves, even children. And um, what is our definition of the aftercare peace track? It is a journey through which children and youth returnees have strengthened resilience and appreciation for a peaceful coexistence. And a part of that program is their families which is very important. Um, families are such a great support system when it comes to reintegration and rehabilitation, when it comes to transformation of, of their behavior. And their journey is strongly guided and supported by an interfaith and multi-sectoral network that we created to transform mindset, to transform behavior. Uh, to create social structures for us to be able to build resilience in these communities. And as a track of the Peace Heroes Formation Program, wherein that was uh, um, the, the program where we started our journey, right? Um, it is a combination of peace education and psychosocial support sessions that uh, contribute to the healing and transformation that are necessary for integration and rehabilitation. And in using the aftercare peace track modules that we created, which is this book. So thank you for making it possible for us. It's very thick, but <laughs> yeah, all hard work, hard work and hard work. And um, in using uh, this toolkit, we intentionally choose and capacitate our what we call peace carers. Peace carers is the term that we use. They are the ones teaching the returnees. They are the ones um, facilitating the sessions, documenting the journey of our returnees, and at the same time, um, the main program implementation team. We ensure that the composition of the peace carer has civil military operations personnel 
or soldiers who whose uh, main responsibility is engaging the community. We also have um, community leaders, such as youth leaders and religious leaders. We have educators as part of our peace carers and social, parasocial workers. Uh, and then uh, we make sure that they are equipped with the right mindset, right skill, right knowledge, as well as all the sensitivities that um, must be practiced all throughout the aftercare peace track journey. And these peace carers have to undergo an extensive course. They had to learn about, of course, an introduction to the aftercare peace track program, a uh, holistic understanding about peace and peace education, the integration of mental health and psychosocial support, um, handling returnees, you know, sensitivities, proper caring, in engaging with our children and youth and attorneys and their families. And they also go through simulation activities because when we handle children and youth attorneys and their families, there are a lot of sensi sensitivities that we must consider. And in line with, uh, I wanted to share also our frameworks. Um, we, this book, we have separate modules for children uh, youth and their families, because we wanted to make sure that these are appropriate in terms of their developmental stages and also sensitive to um, each group's needs. That, again, is, is, is very important. And um, the sessions here aim to um, develop new ways of thinking, uh, feeling, and acting, which can lead them to their vision of peace in line with their relig religious practices and, um, and culture. Um, we're, you, you mentioned about um, rebuilding trust. Uh, when we talk about building trust, it must be supported by a long-term program as it is a long-term process. Um, Ideally, the implementation of uh, this, of, of the modules of the Aftercare Peace Track program uh, are between 6 to 12 months, depending on the assessment of our peace carers, whether there are sessions that must be reinforced, whether, whether there are sessions that need more processing, and another year of monitoring and um, follow-up sessions that are needed. And considering the impact of uh, violent extremism or violent ideology, not just on the families and returnees, but also in the members of the community, it takes a long-term program of psychoeducation. It takes a long-term program of psychosocial um, interventions. Because when we, it, it also takes a long-term program in, uh, in terms of unlearning the violence for peaceful transformation to take place. So definitely it's, it's a, a long-term program. And lastly, in rebuilding trust, in our experience, um, genuine care, love, compassion, and the willingness to listen and understand one another are a big part of our journey. Some of our peace, well, most of our peace carers have been victims of the Marawi siege. And they're the ones teaching the, the returnees. They're the ones facilitating the sessions. So it's not only, um, it, it, wasn't, it was not only a healing process and learning process amongst their children and youth returnees and their families, but it was also for the members of the community. So it was a beautiful experience for everyone. Um, it was not just a program, but what we created was a family. Um, yeah, what we created was a family. It was also more of being a brother, being a sister to every participant in our program. It was also more of creating spaces for them to express themselves. Um, without fear of being judged. And all of these resulted to most of them telling us, well, all of them telling us that we became our safe, uh, we, we, be we became their safe spaces. And lastly, I would like to um, point this out. 
our hard work was our way of making a heartfelt journey for our children and youth returnees and their families. So yeah, so that's the aftercare piece, Jack. Thanks ever so much. We, um, we'll go till about 20 past 12, so we have about 15 minutes. I think there's some questions coming in, Isabella, online, but we have to hear back from Koala first. Um, one of the challenges I think about return and rehabilitation and reintegration is, of course, some people have to be fed through the criminal system and have to go to prison because they've committed crimes. That's absolutely clear. We know that prisons are often a location where radicalization takes place. Managing that process is incredibly difficult. Koala, you do a lot of work in prisons on these issues. Perhaps share with us a, for a couple of minutes your experiences of working in prisons to try to reduce that risk of, of further radicalization. Okay, merci beaucoup. Thank you, Khaled. Vous êtes you are also my sister because what you said was so interesting and has a lot to do with our own process. Now, how do we work? Any kind of intervention requires that the state, the country, uh, supports the program the country has to intervene because we have to remember that in Mali this is a new phenomenon. It's after the 2012 crisis that we saw um, that uh, extremist groups established themselves in the Sahel region and Mali had become uh, the source and the place where you could find all those extremist groups. We wish to intervene, first of all, within the prisons. The military operations on the ground uh, were present, but the military operations sometimes would detain the supposed terrorists, which were often simply uh, farmers or shepherds, and they were supposed to be terrorists, but sometimes they are in jail, they find themselves in jail together with terrorists. In 2018, uh, supposed terrorists, 200 presumed terrorists were put in jail together with terrorists, real terrorists. And after two or three years in prisons, they were uh, freed. But as a matter of fact, you were going to release a new terrorist because he had spent two or three years together in prison with real terrorists. Some detentions were quite unfair. And it explains that uh, there was that uh, transformation of people who were not terrorists at the base and who became terrorists. We created what we called a multidisciplinary, multisectorial commission in order to take care of radicalization within the prisons. That commission is uh, made up by uh, priests, imams, um, doctors, and that commission has various subcommittees, the uh, committee which can make and judge whether a person is going uh, to be radicalized or not in order to separate them how can we make the difference between people who are radicals and those who are being radicalized? How to create a strategy in order to listen to them? How to support them? 
when they're deemed <coughs> innocent, how can we support them once they're back within the community? And I'd like to tell you a short story. Among <coughs> possible extremists, you also find women. After one woman was condemned to perpetuity, that woman was struck by paralysis. The farmers at the time thought she was the victim of a hereditary disease. And GSEF allowed us through the uh, project to recruit a psychologist. That psychologist listened to that woman. And what prevented that woman to uh, walk was not a disease, a, a physical disease. It was all in her head. So she went through various psychological uh, sessions of support, and she uh, could go back to walk. So we, that's a story we chose how the psychological frame of man is important. Very important also is the imam. One imam was, as a matter of fact, a former um, terrorist member of UNJAO, which was established in Gao in the northern part of Mali. It, he was very ideologically convinced, but after a few sessions, psychological sessions, he realized that Imam realized that he was in the wrong, so he was released. And this is a model for us, because within the framework of the program, um, our program, which is training of uh, young actors to bring about positive change, we saw how it's important to take into account the frame of mind of people and to act at a psychological uh, level. Preventing radicalization in prisons, it's crucial for us. It also implies a participation of the local communities and psychological care. We don't. So let's take a couple of questions. Isabella, who, by the way, should, should uh, take all of the credit for this session. She's worked incredibly hard to make this happen. Isabella, any online questions? And then we'll see if there's one or two in the room as well, please. Thank you, Kai. And we have plenty of questions online. So let me summarize all of them in one. OK. Uh, <laughs> Hello, now it works. So we have a couple of questions online. Let me summarize all and I think uh, I can direct it to Khalid. First one comes from Somalia, from the director of the Tubstan PCV Center, our partner there. How can we further promote acceptance of the ex-combatants in their communities? Second one is about the role of the families in the reintegration process. And third one is how we can we engage and convince governments? Uh, three diff uh, difficult questions, but over to you. Thanks, Isabella. Is there any, anyone in the room? Let's take a few questions, then we can perhaps do a, a final round. Sir, please. Yeah, I think that microphone. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for, for the wonderful session. Uh, my question is that um, uh, the reluctance of the um, uh, government in terms of accepting reintegration of uh, the returnees. And uh, as Abdu has mentioned, that uh, these kind of programs, it needs a closer engagement and acceptance of the government. So maybe this is an opportunity for, for me to know if um, 
what are the best ways to make sure that the government, like uh, Ramina, maybe they experience why there's a reluctance into engaging this. I'm speaking on the experience of the most of the sub-Saharan countries, especially the East African countries. It's like uh, um, there's no concrete known plans on the reintegration. Nothing is known about it. So what are the best ways to introduce this kind of program? Thanks. Thanks very much. Any other questions from inside the room, please? Hi, thank you all very much for your time. Um, basically, every panelist has addressed the role of children, how important it is. And I also want to pick up on the theme of prevention. Um, when we're thinking about children and when risk is greatest, but also the impact of an intervention, those ages from zero to five, that first five years of life is, is incredibly important. So how do each of your programs address that first five years of life? What are the interventions? How do the activities address uh, a child's risk in those ages? And to what extent could that be expanded as part of prevention measures? Thank you. Great, thanks very much. Isabel is telling me I have to finish soon, are you? Yeah, we have five, uh, five minutes. Okay, any other interventions or questions in the room? Please, sir, please. Uh, yes, thank you all for a very riveting set of conversations. So um, very often, uh, the role of faith is presented as part of the challenge of preventing violent extremism. I'm wondering if any of you can speak about the potential role of faith in the, in the solution of preventing violent extremism. Have you partnered with faith-based groups? Just what's the role of faith more broadly? Thanks very much. I think the only way we can do this is to go across the panel, invite each of them to spend a couple of minutes wrapping up and see which questions they would like to address very briefly. So a question around trust, how you build trust within communities amongst returnees. I think, Omar, we might hear from you about that. Something about families and children and, and their role and particularly interventions for young people. How we work with governments who are not willing to engage or program to make this uh, happen. And I think that final question as well, I think important, the role of faith as well. So. Um, a couple of minutes from each of you. Let's do the order that we started in. Final comments, any of those questions you'd like to try to answer. They're big questions. We don't have much time. Romina, please. Sure. Yeah, I'll try to summarize. I know that we have um, a few minutes. How do we convince governments to actually um, get engaged into the PVE and the RNR? Governments should do that because then this is, a, this is a revolving door, meaning that if governments do not take care of their citizens in the RNR programs, then we're going to have a vicious circle in which the, the, the phenomenon, the problem will be repeated over and over and over again whenever there is a conflict. So it's a, it's a, it's a movie that everybody has seen. It's the same people that usually try to radicalize people throughout a certain territory. So in case there is no intervention within these communities, then there is always going to be some uh, food for the radicalizers in order for them to be engaged in different conflicts that might arise in different parts of the globe. And this is the only answer I can have to I have to give. The government must engage if they want to really, uh, let's say, um, uh, put an end to uh, the radicalization and to violent extremism in their countries. We'll just pick up on the role of governments and the role of faith. Uh, so first, in the terms of government, um, uh, the Iraqi government has done a really commendable job so far in really being uh, hands-on with this uh, R&R process. Um, they have, they're involved in every aspect of it and they, um, they really push for coordination with all the other international donors and international implementers to make sure that there's a centralization uh, to, to the process. Now, the role of faith is, uh, a little bit more complicated and is a bit, I don't think there's a lot of work happening on it in, in, inside of Iraq on this matter. There is, it's very sensitive. A lot of people look at it as that was the main, one of the main reasons that pushed, uh, you know, for ISIS existence or for extremes and to put, to be, to be there. Um, there is very little work kind of uh, more centralized on centralizing sermons and centralizing, making sure that uh, there is a authority over the mosques in, in Iraq and that the imams are kind of bitten by the centralized sermon that occurring uh, on Fridays, uh, it's, but it, it is very sensitive and it's, uh, there's not much uh, work on happening on it now. There's the more, most of the focus is on kind of providing the basic services, uh, kind of in terms of uh, psychosocial uh, legal service and uh, kind of improving the livelihoods of, of these returnees. But yeah, there should be a lot more work done on that. Please. 
Yeah, um, I've been discussing about children, youth, and families. Uh, one of the things that I would like to highlight is um, our, our flagship program, which is called the Peace Heroes Formation Program. It's about nurturing the seeds of peace in the hearts and minds of our children and young people. Um, one of the foundations of that particular program is the ecological systems theory. Um, when we talk about the ecological systems theory, it's all about we, we experience different types of environment in our lifespan that may influence the behavior, um, the attitude, the values of uh, our children and young people. And one of the closest environments, the direct environment um, that a child has when it comes to influencing behavior is what? Home or families. So that's how critical, how important the role of families are when we talk about prevention, protection, rehabilitation, and reintegration. So all throughout, whatever tracks, um, whatever form of trans transformation, families must always be part of that. Um, and another perspective, uh, when we talk about prevention, uh, ages between zero to 12 years old are very, it's, it's, it's very important. Why? Because when we talk about, of course, when we talk about zero to five, you know, their brains, their brains are like sponges. Everything they see, everything they look at, you know, they try to, to imitate that. But let me also um, get into the perspective of the ages between um, 10 to 12, wherein this is the stage wherein they, um, they're already exploring their identity. They're exploring what group they, sh they must belong to. Um, they idolize heroes. That's why we have kids, you know, um, saying, oh, I want to be like uh, Spider-Man, Superman. I want to be like my dad. So it's very important in our communities that we involve not just the families, but role models um, that, that belong to different sectors, like their teachers, their uh, peers, um, youth leaders in the communities, and even uh, religious leaders. So our young generations need a lot of role models in their communities for them to be peace heroes themselves. Because for children in armed conflict, for children who have been exposed to so much conflict and violence in their lives, um, they don't have much role models in their communities, especially when they don't have um, enough finance to get out of their community and be, be exposed to other aspects in life. So that's how uh, important the, the important families are, and um, investing in uh, in raising a generation of peace heroes, beginning with children and young people. So, because in some, when we talk about PCVE, uh, children and young people are not are not being discussed that much. So, yeah. So thank you for that question. Merci <laughs> beaucoup. Thank you very much. First, let's talk about how to work with uh, religious groups. To be honest, this is a question that uh, interests me greatly. We have a program that we have already implemented. And this program uh, works to engage religious leaders and to work with developing the counter discourse, so the discourse that, that counters extremist groups' discourse. We also are working with them uh, about these different questions with uh, regards to terrorist groups. We have the imams and Christian leaders in Mali, and so we have worked with them to develop this counter discourse and we use social media and different online platforms in order to share this uh, this discourse why there are some extremists who use uh, uh, verses from the Quran in order to to hijack them and distort them so that they can serve their own convictions and they can serve the ideals of these extremist groups there are religious leaders who already know the content of these holy books and so they are able to give information with regards to the verses that are used by these terrorist groups and that is what we use to influence our own counter discourse 
how to make sure that the ex uh, fighters are accepted by the community. We have uh, created what we call the uh, approximate um, discourse with the community. We have uh, certain leaders who are former uh, combatants, and they have uh, organized some awareness raising sessions and some training sessions. We have uh, trained them first on how to address these different questions. So thank you so much. Uh, I will stop there. Thank you. I, I, I'm a, sorry we don't have more time to take these interesting questions. I won't try to summarize, but let me just make three points. Firstly, I think we are all in awe of the work that you are all doing. It's clearly difficult and challenging. And as you said, it's a long-term process. I think this work will become more important, not less important. I think we're facing historic returns from terrorist groups around uh, the world. And I still believe that working with those people can stop others becoming terrorists. So this is a really important piece of work that you're all doing. Secondly, I think it's really important, despite the different contexts, that we try to learn from each other. And I hope that this panel has been one example of how, despite the very different challenges that you're facing, you can begin to work with each other to share lessons and, and, and make those lessons richer. GSURF certainly is trying to do that through our online platforms as well. And that's the third point. Uh, in various ways, our organization, GSURF, supports all of you and your countries. And you have my absolute commitment that we will continue to do so because this is really fundamental work. Colleagues and the 50 or so colleagues online, including I gather from Somalia and other countries, please would you join me in thanking our, our great panel.